Hello and welcome. My name is Meeplus Dehishi, and today's pick is a lot. Plan one was to catch up on K. O'Neill's latest work. Then I realized they changed their name and pronouns, and I wanted to update all my old reviews to, ref to reflect that. So now we are going to take a short look at all seven of O'Neill's books, with range from picture book to middle grade. Lots of good memories. Let's see if they hold up. Content notes for fishing, environmental devastation, people and animals eat meat, magic battles, and debilitating injury. Starting out with the shortest title for the youngest audience, Dewdrop was one of the new books I had not picked up before and was published by Oni Press in 2020. Keywords that came to mind reading this picture book were water, cheering friends on, anthropomorphism, axolotl, and achieving. The titular Dewdrop is an axolotl who works overtime to keep all of his underwater friends encouraged. There's a weightlifting turtle, cooking minnows, and so much more. Moving the audience level up just a tad, we have Princess Princess Ever After, published in 2016 by Oni Press. I'm not a kids lit expert, but this feels like it's hitting in the middle grade between picture books and chapter books. Keywords that came to mind reading this story were escape, mischief, misunderstanding, and misunderstood, love, and happily ever after. It's a queer fairy tale. Two princesses and an adorable dragon adventuring across the countryside fighting against a jealous sorceress. Scrolling the negative reviews, a lot of people were just knee-jerk against the quote, gay agenda, which is as expected as it is stupid. More constructive criticism was that having the dark-skinned character be more masculine and the light-skinned character be more feminine does play into media stereotypes. The critique I haven't made my mind up about is that Sadie is not drawn fat enough. Like, I get that we need more slash better slash fatter representation, and it does feel like perhaps the book included a bit too much fat phobic villain content to be comfortable, even though it's supposed to be showing villain as bad, obviously. But to basically say that Sadie is not fat enough for people to be fat phobic still felt a bit odd to me. That said, I'm not really here to tone police my fellow fat people, and I'm glad people shared their thoughts, so I could be inspired to think more deeply myself. Overall, a bit short and simplistic, but not terribly so considering the demographic, I had rated this quick read three stars. Next up, we have the also new to me Aquacorn Cove, published by Oni Press in 2018. Considering this potential age range, it is perhaps surprising how many tough topics O'Neill chooses to tackle in this otherwise very cozy and whimsical story. Although it did feel a bit uneven at times, with the environmental message dominating over the loss of Lana's mother in an odd way. Keywords that came to mind reading this under 100 page book. Oceans, storms, tension, destruction, and community. Flipping the book over, Aquacorn Cove is described thusly. Quote, when Lana and her father return to their seaside hometown to help clear the debris of a storm, the last thing she expects is to discover a colony of aquacorns, magical seahorse-like residents of the coral reef. As she explores the damaged town and the fabled undersea palace, Lana learns that while she cannot always count on adults to be the guardians she needs, she herself is capable of finding the strength to protect both the ocean and her own happiness. End quote. Scrolling through the negative reviews on good old Goodreads, I had to chuckle a little bit at the number of people who opened their reviews with the, quote, unpopular opinion that they liked the art but didn't like X, Y, or Z about the story. Although, to be fair, negative reviews were in the minority. That is perhaps the most uncontroversial way to critique an O'Neill title, and I was actually kind of pleased to see one person whose list of critiques all circled around the art instead of the story. The main complaint that seemed the most consistent across these reviews is that while the book was strongly against Aunt May's current fishing practices, Aunt May's aquatic romantic interest was okay with some level of subsist subsistence fishing, because to these people's minds, no fishing is ever okay. I suspect these people are some sort of vegan, and to a certain extent, I do respect that most meat consumption is ultimately unethical, but I'm not a vegan, and so I do see this as a binary thinking taken a few steps too far. Although I'm definitely feeling vindicated in listing fishing slash hunting in the content notes at the start of my reviews when appropriate. Circling back to my own major critique of the work, I felt like O'Neill is putting too much emphasis on the individual slash small communities to save the ocean. The problem is clearly the ultra wealthy who jet distances long and short at the drop of a hat and the American military who pollutes more than most mid-sized countries and builds bases that destroy local ocean habitat like in Okinawa, Japan. 
among many other cases. I don't care that this world is fictional. This is a lesson that readers are being encouraged to think about in the real world. In addition, if we are getting a bit more nitty gritty, I'm not sure how overfishing is supposed to directly cause storms. It was also a bit odd that some frames included Aunt May with a cigarette in her mouth. Unusual in modern children's lit, at least in my experience, and its appearance was so brief, appears to be unlit and uncommented in a way that made it all the more odd. Of course, what Kay O'Neill does well, they continue to knock out of the park in this volume. We get people of widely varied shapes and sizes, colors and sexualities, with a dash more hair texture diversity than I remember seeing previously. I would say the main arc of the plot does revolve around an interpersonal conflict, but that only highlights the way that everyone does end up caring for each other all the more. But plus there's some interesting framing and page layouts, three stars. Moving right along, we have perhaps their most popular series, the Tea Dragon Trilogy with the Tea Dragon Society published in 2017, the Tea Dragon Festival published in 2019, and the Tea Dragon Tapestry published in 2021, all by Oni Press. Stepping up to short but large format graphic novels, now with chapters, the series in Aquacorn Cove have also both inspired board games. Keywords that came to mind, tea, creative problems, problem solving, awkwardness, anxiety, home, coming of age slash self-discovery, wheelchairs, and relationships. Reading Tea Dragon Society, the characters very slightly felt like an AU fanfiction of Princess Princess. This story, the stories are pretty different, but the character designs and personalities felt very similar. Quote, a charming all ages book that follows the story of Greta, a blacksmith apprentice, and the people she meets as she becomes entwined in the enchanting world of tea dragons. After discovering a lost tea dragon in the marketplace, Greta learns about the dying art of tea dragon caretaking from the kind tea shop owners, Hezekiel and Eric. As she befriends them and their shy ward, Minette, Greta sees how the craft enriches their lives and eventually her own. End quote. Moving on to the Chi Dragon Festival, it does jump back in time and give us a story of different people who knew Hezekiel and Eric earlier in their lives. There's a more romantic air to this volume, but nothing particularly direct. The main village for this story is in fact vegetarian, although other people in the story do eat meat and it seems to be a me do me and you do you situation. We also get sign language. Quote, Rin has grown up with the tea dragons that inhabit her village, but stumbling across a real dragon turns out to be a different matter entirely. Aiden is a young dragon who was appointed to protect the village, but fell asleep in the forest 80 years ago. With the aid of Rin's adventuring uncle Eric and his partner Hezekiel, they investigate the mystery of his enchanted sleep. But Rin's real challenge is to help Aiden come to terms with feeling that he cannot get back the time he has lost. End quote. Finally, in book three, the Tea Dragon Tapestry, things are tied up rather nicely with a jump back forward in time and a reuniting of all the characters we met in the first two books. Grief and Grieving is more front and center for some characters in this volume. Quote, over a year since being entrusted with Jinsing's care, Greta still can't chase away the cloud of mourning that hangs over the timid tea dragon as she struggles to create something spectacular enough to impress a master blacksmith in search of an apprentice. She questions the true meaning of crafting and the true meaning of caring for someone in grief. Meanwhile, Minette receives a surprising package from the monastery where she was once trained to be a prophetess. Thrown into confusion about her path in life, the shy and reserved Minette finds that the more she opens her heart to others, the more clearly she can see what was always inside. End quote. A lot to like about this series overall. I really appreciate how characters weren't good at new things right away. And after a month of not reaching out to someone, a character was encouraged to finally do so. And no one made them feel bad about it. The dragons can apparently shift from both looking either human or dragon and across the gender spectrum. I still didn't find much of anything to nitpick about the series. And last but certainly not least, we are moving to the regular book size longest book to date, middle grade chapter book, The Moth Keeper, published by RH Graphics in 2023. Keywords for desert, night, Loneliness, moth, decompressed, and community. Another story of quietly overcoming everyday difficulties. The color scheme is nicely subdued, and we have totally left the anime princess hair behind. Everyone looks nicely scruffy. I also really enjoyed how decompressed the page layouts were. There's a lot of silence and beautiful visuals. That said, I would not have had the concentration to read this as a middle grader. Quote, being a moth keeper is a huge responsibility and a great honor, but what happens when the new moth keeper decides 
decides to take a break from the moon and see the sun for the first time. A middle grade fantasy graphic novel about passion, duty, and found family. End quote. At the end of the book, O'Neill did write a page about why they chose this particular setting for their story, but it did sort of leave me wondering where the line is for when something becomes Orientalist. For my untrained eye, this was mostly inspired by the owl character in particular, but I'm certainly not the judge on that and should track down some discourse to develop my understanding more. This being a very recent publication, the handful of negative reviews were all focused on the gays, la gas, sigh, which is all they've written so far, literally. But before we conclude, I had almost forgotten to include a brief author bio section. So let's remedy that. A self-taught writer and illustrator based out of New Zealand, also known as Aotearoa, Kay is interested in creatures and mindfulness, both of which definitely show through in all their writing. They've won an Eisner, an Harvey Award, and a Dwayne McDuffie Award for children's comics, and were featured on the ALA Rainbow List. Much like myself, they like listening to podcasts. Which really does bring us to the end of this particular creator profile. Definitely leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Bye y'all, keep reading, and stand with striking workers. And Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional landholders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anamishnabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.